Uh, welcome back. I'm Tony Hernandez. This is the Tony Hernandez Show. Today is December 7th, and we have a big show today. I'm very excited and honored to have a Minnesota gubernatorial candidate and former Minnesota State Representative Marty Seifert on the show. We're going to be talking about his uh, recent announcement, his candidacy, and some of the issues, and just learn a little more about uh, Marty. But uh, before I get into that, I must say I've been freezing cold. The last couple days here in Minnesota have just been unbelievably cold. You know, when you get out to the car and twist the key in the ignition, you hear, rawr, rawr you know that it's cold and my poor son Maximilian experiencing his, his first winter I, I tell you every time we bring him outside he, he loses his breath for about uh, uh, five seconds until we get him into the safety of the car but I just hope everybody drives safe out there it's really icy I, I slipped a couple times today and just kept sliding so just drive extra slow if you're on the Minnesota roads uh, you're going to get to where you're going and, and just get there safe. So uh, before we bring uh, Marty on, Dallas, if we could pop up uh, Marty's website, it's Seifert for Governor, and uh, we'll put that on the uh, computer screen. And uh, Marty Seifert is a husband, he's a father, he's a businessman, he's a former teacher, and he's a leader who is running for the governor of Minnesota. He was born on April 23rd, 1972 in Springfield, Minnesota and Seifert grew up the youngest of six boys on a small family farm near Clements, Minnesota. He's the son of Rita and a late Norbert. His father was a farmer with an eighth grade education and his mother was a teacher and a homemaker. I like this part. While growing up, Seifert picked rocks, he pulled weeds, picked cucumbers on his hands and knees, I wish we had pictures of that, and did various farm jobs to save money for college. He worked at the Dairy King, uh, I don't know if that's the, the sister of Dairy Queen, in Redwood Falls. And uh, while in high school, he was a, a pizza delivery guy for Domino's Pizza. Uh, he got his bachelor's degree in political science from Southwest Minnesota State University in 1995. From 99 to 2006, he was an admissions counselor at the college, and he had a focus on recruiting. And uh, he's also the co-owner of Cypher Properties. From 1997 to 2011, he served in the Minnesota House of Representatives, representing Lyon, Redwood, and Yellow Medicine Counties. He was re-elected by large margins, always winning re-election by over 20 points. Wow. In 2010, Seifer retired from the House of Representatives after 14 years of serving. He obtained his real estate license and has chiefly been a buyer's agent for real estate retrievers in Marshall. He was also hired in 2010 to be the executive director of Avera Marshall Foundation, and uh, he's also a family man. So we have uh, Marty uh, calling in, and uh, let's see if we can uh, get him. Hello, Marty. Are you with us? I am. How are you, Tony? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, thanks for uh, coming on the show. We certainly appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. And is it as cold in Marshall as it is here in the Twin Cities? Seven below. Woo! Woo! I tell you. They, they, that's where they get the term uh, Minnesota tough, you know. Being yeah, we're in, this we're in the warm event. south down here in Marshall. It's yeah, warm way down south, huh? So before we get into everything, I did first of all, I've heard people pronounce your name two different ways. I've yeah. heard Seifert and Seifert. Can you just clear the air? Yeah. How do you pronounce your name? Yeah, it's Seifert. It's a German. Uh, the E and the I are opposite of what you might think, so it is Seifert. Okay, so you have German uh, and ancestry. When did the when did your family or your ancestors uh, come to Minnesota? Well, I, I'm German and Belgian. Uh, my area of the state actually has the largest concentration of people of Belgian ancestry of mm. any part of the country, down in Lyon County, Minnesota. Believe it or not. Wow. My wife is from Ghent, Minnesota, which is obviously Ghent, Belgium, is what it's named after. Uh, so I'm one quarter Belgian. I'm three quarters German. My wife is opposite, three quarters Belgian and one quarter German. So our kids are fifty fifty. And my ancestors, Tony, came here after the Civil War. Okay. Um, to Nuwalm, Minnesota, and then headed west from there. Uh, Nuwalm has the largest concentration of people of German ancestry per capita than any city in the United States. Wow. So it's an interesting history. Uh, they came uh, probably 18, late 1860s, early 1870s. So with all the German-Americans and Belgian-Americans down there, I'd imagine there's some pretty good uh, beer and pubs in the area? Yeah, there, there is a few bars out in this neck of the woods. Uh, the ironic thing 
um, being German and Catholic, as people assume, you know, that I might tip a few uh, beers here and there, and I, I don't drink. Mm. And so it is kind of funny. I don't lecture people who do, mm -hmm. but uh, it's nothing that ever appealed to me. So it, it's, you know, kind of funny in, the, in that way because people always say, uh, you know, well, gee, you must uh, be a big beer drinker, and I'm, I'm really not. So yeah. uh, it is kind of funny. So you said you, you've always kind of been a, a non-drinker then. You, did you experiment when you were, when you were younger, or you just right oh, away a little you bit, didn't Yeah, oh, I mean, I'm not going to lie and say never drank in college a little bit here <laughs> and there. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's just nothing. What I observed, Tony, in the legislature is, you know, alcohol really had the root of a lot of problems mm. with lawmakers um, getting into trouble. <laughs> Uh, in more ways than one, yeah. and so I just figured, you know, we got these various guys having trouble in their marriage, uh, mm -hmm. DWIs, mm -hmm. uh, all sorts of other issues, not making good judgments on the floor, and uh, a lot of it stemmed from alcohol, frankly, and so I just, you know, never really appealed to me, so, you know, we just... Uh, we just never got into that. Well, I think, uh, you know, if you're going to be a leader of a great state like Minnesota, uh, the principle of sobriety, I think, is, is absolutely a good thing. And, and I'd also say that, you know, alcohol being a problem that you saw in, in the legislature, maybe with some individuals, it, it's also a problem in families throughout Minnesota and in, in the country. It's actually one of the number one reasons why families end up breaking up is, is because of... Uh, alcoholism and addiction so it's, a, it's like anything in moderation is probably okay but right. there's people who just uh, can't handle it and right it leads to domestic problems it leads to a lot of other issues so you know like i said i don't lecture people who do it but mm -hmm. just nothing that really uh, appealed to me but uh, yeah we got a lot of we got a lot of people down in, in my part of the state that uh, are, are german belgian whatever but right. you know norwegian swedes and and, of course, a lot of the newer immigrants that have come in. We actually have multi-generational uh, immigrants here that came in the 70s yeah. and 80s to work the farms. And, and oh, yeah. I kind of chuckled myself when you talked about picking cucumbers because uh, many of the migrant workers who came from Texas via Mexico mm -hmm. uh, or Mexico via Texas that worked on the fields and the neighboring fields mm -hmm. to the west of my farm mm -hmm. um, were, uh, you know, frankly, immigrants who came through the legal process. But, Absolutely. Uh, were farm workers, and then when the uh, pickle season pretty much dried up in September, or the cucumber season, not pickles, but cucumbers, uh, they went back uh, to the south um, with their families. Um, but we had a lot of migrant workers that, uh, that worked with us when we went to the... Um, the, the pickle sorting uh, factory oh, that yeah. was in, uh, there were two of them, one in Franklin, one in Wanda. So really the value of hard work and family has is, is been with me for a long time. Yeah, that's, that's uh, interesting you brought up that point. My grandpa actually, his family made that same immigration path from, from Mexico to Texas, and then they ended up in, in Minnesota for, for those same reasons. Uh, so, Marty, you ran, uh, you ran for uh, the Republican endorsement uh, for the governorship in 2010. And that was a historic year for Republicans. Uh, for the first time in a long time, they won uh, the state House and Senate majorities. But uh, we ended up losing uh, the governor's seat for the first time in a while to DFL or Governor Mark Dayton. Why do you think that Governor Dayton won? And what do you plan on doing uh, differently if you make it all the way to the general election in 2014? Sure. Well, I think uh, Governor Dayton benefited from having a lot of money spent on his behalf, and he spent it, uh, you know, on television. But probably the the more important point is that he had a lot of liberal allies in his ex-wife and others who spent millions and millions of dollars on TV ads. Were there some mistakes made by Republicans? I'm sure there were, but um, you know, it was a narrow, narrow election, less than ten thousand votes. And, you know, from my perspective, I'm going to run a very disciplined campaign, um, speak in, uh, I think, more specifics than any other candidate who's running right now on either party. And if you look at my you know, website at cypheredforgovernor.com, you can see that we've got a, a five-point platform that I think is very bold. I mean, elimination of the Met Council, uh, there's nobody talking about that, and mm -hmm. it is very achievable. Um, we find a lot of people who, who are in the metro area who say, I can't believe that an appointed body that is unelected has the ability to have such vast taxing and regulatory authority as the Met Council. And people move here from other states, as you just mentioned, 
or other places, and they're astounded that their property taxes can be uh, raised on a whim by the Metropolitan Council members who, who do you vote out? You know, they're not elected. So mm. uh, we have some bold plans, I think, that are very attractive to people, and I think that's what's going to carry us to victory in 2014. We, uh, our main thing is we've got to get nominated uh, in the primary on August 12th. I'm aggressively seeking delegates to go to caucuses the first Tuesday of February. The state party chairman, Keith Downey, told me last week they are going to have a ballot for governor and for U.S. Senate the night of caucuses. And so when people go to vote on the first night of Tuesday in, in uh, February, they will be able to vote for governor and senator on the Republican side and then run for delegate or alternate to the next level of convention. And that's really exciting when people have some choices and we've got some great candidates to choose from. Oh, yeah, there, there's no doubt about that. And I, I have to say congratulations for placing so well in the straw poll at the Minnesota State Central. Uh, this was before you had even announced to anyone about your in intention or your candidacy for the Minnesota governor. And you still ended up uh, placing uh, number three. Uh, three, I believe, um, Jeff Johnson, uh, who was also on the show earlier, he, he was number one. And then State Senator uh, Dave Thompson, who's also was on the show a while ago, he finished number two. And and you were number three. And, and, and like I said, you weren't even uh, campaigning at that point. So uh, the activists and the people who are on the uh, grassroots are, are definitely, there's still a lot of support for you. Yeah, we, we were somewhat astounded because we... Uh I asked my treasurer earlier in the year, how much do we have in our bank account? We had $5.83, <laughs> I think. And uh, we put up no signs. Certainly I had people in the hallway who recognized me and had their picture with me, and we shook some hands and slapped some backs. But once I got into the convention hall, Tony, the, uh, the Capitol Press Corps was all perched in the back of the room, and they were three rows behind me. And so I sat calmly in my chair, visited with the guy next to me, but I didn't run around the convention hall uh, whispering in people's ears saying, write me in. I sat in, and the reporters watched me like a hawk or like a vulture or whatever bird of prey that you want to give an analogy <laughs> to. Uh, they, they were watching me very closely. So I didn't give a speech. Uh, they gave every candidate the opportunity to give a speech before the convention. My name was never placed in nomination. I was just sitting there. So I, w I was very, very proud of uh, the fact that people were interested in and getting me back in the saddle. And, and one question I get frequently, Tony, is why did you wait so long? Why didn't you jump into this thing in June or July? Or Scott Honor got in in April. You know, he got in a long time ago. And the, the, the frank and honest answer is when I was hired by the hospital, I worked for the Catholic Hospital down in Marshall here, I promised them that I would get their cancer center built into groundbreaking and that we would have enough money and cash and pledges to build the building equip it, furnish it, and have enough money for two years of operational losses raised before I, before I did anything. And we didn't hit our groundbreaking ceremony till after State Central. And so I want to keep my word. I'm a man of my word. And uh, if we had not raised the $4 million we needed to raise for the cancer center, all private sector money, by the way, uh, that, that we raised, um, I would not be in the governor's race today if we still had to raise another million dollars. Uh, to get the thing built, I would be uh, deferring on the race and just staying out of it. Hmm. Well, there's a there's a very strong field of Republican candidates. We mentioned uh, Hennepin County Commissioner Jeff Johnson and State Senator Dave Thompson and, and yourself. And we've invited uh, the other uh, uh, potential or the candidates running for the endorsement on the show. We haven't had them on yet. Uh, but what I want to hear from you, Marty, is is what sets you apart from uh, the rest of the field? And then also a number of uh, uh, the candidates have said that they're going to continue to run into the primary no matter what happens with the endorsement. And can you tell us a little more about your intentions with that? Well, yeah, there's a, a, a variety of questions there. Let me, uh, let me take the last one first. Mm -hmm. I am open to running in the primary. I'm, I'm not triggering one, obviously, Tony. You mentioned that uh, uh, two other candidates have already said they're probably heading out and not, not abiding by endorsement. So I'm not triggering a primary. Last time in 2010, had I run in the primary against Tom Emmer, I would have triggered a primary. And it's different participating in a primary versus triggering a primary. So I am open to running, but I think I can pull off the trifecta of getting endorsed and winning the primary and winning the general. Um, I am uniquely qualified for that, I believe. 
Well, I made a, I made a, not to interrupt you, but I made a prediction uh, two weeks ago on, on this show, and I said that if that trifecta is accomplished by the Republican candidate, we will have a new governor in, in 2014 and sworn in in 2015, no doubt about that. I, I, I agree with that. Um, I also uh, would say what makes me uniquely qualified, um, not to speak to the other candidates because I think they're all good people, um, I am unique in the following ways. Number one, when I ran for the legislature seven times, I was always the top vote-getter for the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. When I ran for re-election six times, I had between 60 and 70 percent of the vote every single time, uh, won between 20 and 40 points over the other candidates. This is at the same time that my district was being carried by people like Bill Clinton, Colin Peterson, Amy Klobuchar, Mike Hatch, Lori Swanson. So... Democrats were carrying my district, but I was winning 60 to 70 percent of the vote when, in my re-election run. And what do you attribute that to? Well, I, I mean, I, the press corps asked me that when I announced. I said, well, I, I suppose they like me. I mean, the vo if the voters didn't like you, they wouldn't be voting for you and switching over. We had 25 to 30 percent of the electorate switching around in the different races. So Minnesota is very much like that. They're very independent-minded vote. I think they like straight talk, which I obviously do. I think they like solutions, which I'm offering. You can see on my website uh, some of the ideas that mm -hmm. we have because people at the end of the day want leadership, and that is the number one issue in this race is leadership, and Governor Dayton hasn't provided that for the state. The other thing I think that makes me unique is that uh, I can stitch the rural and the metro together uh, in, in uh, the election to uh, have a very holistic approach uh, to the election. Um, I don't take money from lobbyists. I never have in any of my seven races for the House or my previous run for governor. Uh, when I was in the legislature, out of the 201 senators and representatives, I was one of four that refused to take money from lobbyists for my campaign account. Uh, so I'm very, very unique that way, Tony, because as you know, uh, the lobbyist money for incumbents is the easiest money you can get. And I just never believed in that. And so I'm very unique on both parties, Mark Dayton or the other Republicans, in that I, I believe in representing the constituency and uh, not the special interest. Yeah, and, you know, I want to vouch for you too, Marty, just knowing you over the last uh, years when we met. Uh, I know that you are a class act, and I know that you stand behind uh, your word. I, I don't doubt that for one second. And uh, what, what I wanted to talk to you about a little bit is some of the things, you know, you're, you're a big name here in Minnesota. A lot of people know who you are. And, and, you know, as you rise up, you'll find more and more people trying to whack you at your shins. And uh, so I wanted to just address a couple of the things that, that I hear sometimes on the radio or from other sure. people. And just so that we can uh, address that here. And I'd, I'd like to hear uh, what you have to say about it. Uh, the first one is in 2010. Now, you ran all the way to the endorsement. Uh, it was a, a very strong campaign that you ran ag uh, against Tom Emmer. You know, ultimately, at the end of the day, you're both on the same same team. Um, I remember watching you guys debate at Champs in Minnetonka, and you guys were you know going back and forth, and it was all about the issues. It was about principles, and it was about uh, policy, which I really appreciated and, and learned a ton from just uh, watching you guys uh, compete against each other in, in a healthy manner. Uh, one of the things that people have said later on uh, about you is that you know when you didn't get the endorsement that um you know that you weren't so helpful uh with the with the emmer for governor campaign i personally i didn't see that but i wanted to let you uh, address that oh, part sure. of it sure yeah that's a great question well when when i lost the endorsement as you know tony i stood on stage and i heartily endorsed tom right. i asked the convention to unanimously endorse him uh and my supporters were in tears i mean they were distraught and I told them, take your Seifert stickers off and put your Emmer stickers on. I remember that. We put it out on Facebook and Twitter to support Tom Emmer. We followed that up with uh, visits at the party's request for me to speak on the ticket's behalf, all the way top to bottom, House candidates all the way up to Tom Emmer, in various communities in Minnesota like Wilmer, uh, St. James, Redwood Falls, Little Falls, up in the Moorhead area, uh, down in Marshall, uh, Tom came through on a day where I was not able to make it, so we had a letter read on um, my behalf telling the crowd, I want you to vote for Tom Emmer. Um, uh, was I in the Metro 
very much. No, I wasn't. But at that point, I'm taking money out of my own pocket to drive three hours up and three hours back. And I'm not sure what the expectation was for people that I was supposed to take out of my, my, my campaign was in debt at that time. So I don't know if people were expecting me to pay out of my own pocket to go campaign all over the state. But in the meantime, I got hired at Avera Marshall, which is a Catholic-sponsored nonprofit hospital in Marshall. Mm -hmm. I got hired in September of 2010. And part of the hiring process was we know you are involved in politics, and we do really not, don't want to see you uh, actively involved in partisan outward politics, uh -huh. stumping around, etc. Because we are a nonpartisan organization, and if we're going to build a cancer center, uh, the Democrats in town may not be appreciative of you eviscerating them. And so, uh, in September, when I signed on to be hired at the hospital as a nonprofit with a tax exempt status. And some of you know how the Obama administration treats nonprofits' tax exempt status when they become partisan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, they get audited and beat up. So I promised I would not do that. And so when people said I dropped off the radar mm -hmm. politically in September of ten, they are correct. But the reason wasn't because I didn't like Tom Emmer. The reason was I wanted my real job in the private sector, which a lot of detractors told me. You need to be in the private sector. You've been a public school teacher. You've worked at a public college. You've been in the legislature. Um, we think you ought to be in the private sector. That's what some of my detractors had said. Uh -huh. And so when I want to go into the private sector and work at my real job at the hospital, in conjunction with my real estate firm, uh, now people are saying, well, gee, uh, you know, you should have not been doing that. You should have been doing the partisan campaigning uh, in September, October, and November of 2010. So that's the long explanation, Tony, but I, I think it's important for your listeners to hear that because when I explain it that way, every single person in the room says, well, that makes total sense. Right. So, so basically, in summary, um, you, you, you had the work to support your family is essentially well, what it comes down to. That's which I, works, yeah. I, under yeah, but, I understand. But up until that time, um, and I have witnesses, if people don't believe me, that I was in Little Falls. In fact, Kurt Zellers was there as the minority leader and witnessed my speech on behalf of Emmer and on behalf of Mike Lemire, the local House candidate. And I thought it was a really good speech that I gave. But the thing is, is the people in the Twin Cities that are wondering where was Marty, well, were they in Little Falls listening to my speech? Probably not. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Well, well, thanks for uh, thanks for uh, explaining that, Marty. And uh, you know, the second thing that that I've heard, and and you know, I looked at your record, and, and I'm trying to trying to figure out where this, these people are, are coming from, what point of view they're speaking from. Uh, but I, you know, on the radio, I listen to uh, the Jack and Ben show every once in a while, driving to work in the morning. And, you know, they have people calling in. And there was somebody who, who was going on and on about your record and the environment. And yeah, but I had one out of 4,800 votes. I had one vote for one energy bill that I wish I could take back that is on my platform of five issues to do a complete repeal. Which one, which one is that? Bill. Which one is that, Marty? Can you the, explain? the next generation energy bill is what they're talking about. Okay. And it's one vote out of 4,800 votes or more that I took in 14 years. And the detractors are all hanging their hat on this one vote that I think out of our caucus of 47, I think all but nine voted for that bill. Now, that doesn't make it right, but when you say, I wish I hadn't voted for it and I am for complete repeal, and I put it in my announcement and I put it on my website, I don't know what people want from me. I mean, I, I admit I made a mistake, and I'm for repealing it, and it's the only vote out of all of the votes that people have been detracting about that anyone ever brings up. And so I think it's just really um, people who either don't like me or are trying to find in vain a reason to not support me mm -hmm. and support their candidate, whoever their candidate might be. Mm -hmm. Um, I really don't think there's a lot of there there uh, because I rarely hear about any other issues with my voting record. But, you know, we all, all of us who are running have something. 
that doesn't make us a perfect candidate. And I think in fact, somebody said it's refreshing to have someone man up and say, hey, there's a vote I probably shouldn't have taken. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, Jack Tomzak has worked with Kurt Zellers for, for years. He's an extremely good friend with him. They worked, I think, for Rod Grams together. So as various radio hosts, uh, you know, take a lead pipe to me or invite well, me to I, come I should, the show. Well, I should, I should clarify, though. It wasn't Jack who was, who was, who was saying this. It was, uh, it was a Republican activist caller who called into the show, sure. just to clarify. Yeah, I, I know. I know that there's been some <laughs> some commentary from Jack and in other shows that were not necessarily kind. And I'm I'm hoping eventually he'll invite me onto his show, uh, so I can you know kind of defend myself and mm-hmm. and say, hey, uh, here's where I'm at on the issues, and mm-hmm. and um, here's why I'd be a good governor. Because as you mentioned earlier, at the end of the day, uh, we have to win this thing. And uh, Dayton has got to go as the governor, and I think I'm the one guy who can beat him. Out of all of us who are running right now, I am the only one who has ever been ahead of Mark Dayton in a nonpartisan poll, and that was the Channel 5 Eyewitness News poll that was conducted in 2010 pre-convention. Um, you know, granted, a lot of people say, well, we should never pay attention to polls, uh, but at the end of the day, a lot of them are fairly predictable of what happens. Mm. And so I'm the only guy out of the five or six of us running who has ever been ahead of Mark Dayton in a public poll. And I know it's very uncomfortable for people to hear this in the Republican Party, but we cannot win unless we get the votes of non-Republicans in the state. That's just the way it is. That's the math. That's the reality. And some of the uh, more impractical delegates uh, stick their fangs out and say, well, that's not true if we just beat people up with lead pipes a little bit more and we're a little more nasty, uh, we would get more votes. And I just don't believe that. I think the way we are going to win votes is solutions and leadership and getting people's trust and confidence that we do care about people. I work at a Catholic hospital where we don't turn people away based on inability to pay. And I get very offended when Mark Dayton and Barack Obama and others say that we don't care about people, because as a Republican, I do care about people. I see people every day when I'm administrator on call in the mental health unit, in the emergency room, in the surgery center, who need help. And some aren't going to live if we don't give them help. And the sisters down in my area, I don't speak for them and they don't speak for me, but compassion, stewardship, those are the types of values we live by at our hospital. And I believe all the hospitals, whether they are Catholic or not Catholic, live by a spirit and by the values that we take care of people based on their need, not an ability to pay. And so I think if we tell people we have some market-based solutions, along with a safety net, to be able to provide people with the health care they need, we as Republicans are going to do very well. But if we just say, you know what, you're on your own, we don't care, um, that isn't the message that's going to make it in the 21st century in Minnesota or, frankly, anywhere else. There's, there's no doubt about that because people are starting to see more and more that despite the rhetoric from the Democrats here in Minnesota about caring and compassion, when you look at the actual policies that they spend the most time and energy investing into, uh, it comes down to, to stadiums and, and other crony capitalist uh, type uh, projects in the light, mass. Light rail. Of, light rail or, or stadiums or, you know, even certain parts of education spending, I think, goes goes right. down that line as well. And, you know, they say a picture is worth uh, a thousand <laughs> words, Marty. And I, I found this picture today, actually, and we're popping it up right now. It's Ziggy Wolf. And uh, Governor Dayton uh, taking out the soil for, for the first time at the new Vike Stadium. And when I first saw this picture, I thought it was Photoshopped. I thought it was a, a spoof. I did, too. Uh, but it turns out the photographer, after I tweeted it, uh, tweeted me back and said, no, this was in the Star Tribune, uh, page A1, I think it came on. So He tweeted me, too, when I said was this Photoshopped. <laughs> it's just amazing, though. It's it's uh, you know this is the face of caring. You know this is Democrat compassion right here. It's it's really not about the people. It's about the money, and it's yep. about the cronies. And and you know to me this picture just speaks volumes about uh, the direction that our state is heading in right now, and why so desperately uh, we need to change course here in Minnesota. 
Yeah, I, I agree with that, Tony, and I, I think that uh, that, that picture is worth 10,000 words. Um, <laughs> there's just so much going on there, and, and someone had said that either on Facebook or Twitter or the Internet, it was the most viewed picture for two days uh, in the upper Midwest because people were sharing it so much. Mm -hmm. That picture illustrates the need why we need a different governor, and mm -hmm. I don't care if you're liberal, conservative, independent, Democrat or Republican, black or white, rich or poor, rural, urban, suburban, gay or straight. We can go through every demographic, young or old. That picture explains to the people of Minnesota without a caption why we need a different governor. No doubt about that, Marty. Well, I, I want to thank you so much again for coming on the show. It's an honor having you here. I hope that you can uh, make another uh, uh, visit in the near future because we'd want to learn more about uh, your, your campaign. Do you know, can you give us some uh, events that are going to be coming up here in the near future and also let people know before you leave how they can connect and help out your campaign? Absolutely. Um, they can go to cyphertforgovernor.com and we have a we put our Twitter feed right on the front page so people can look at where we're at and where we're going. Um, I'm going to be at the, the uh, uh, Steele County Republicans uh, down in Medford on uh, Monday evening. Uh, throughout the week, we'll be traveling to different places around the state. Uh, we have a Christmas party slash Christmas concert for my kids on uh, Thursday night, so I'm, I am going to have that one night where I'm not able to go to uh, the Voices of Conservative Women are having an event, and I apologize, they can't go, but my kids are important to me, too. Um, we have a variety of various places that we're going. We've been to over 20 cities, Tony, since I announced two weeks ago, Wow! and we have an airplane, we're running around with that, and it has been a wonderful, wonderful reception, uh, regardless if we're in Worthington or we're, whether in, we're Duluth or the Twin Cities. It has been just absolutely fantastic, and a lot of people who supported Tom Emmer. God bless him uh, for the campaign that he ran. Um, but a lot of people who supported Tom Emmer and myself last time who are saying, you know what, we're with you this time. And uh, I think we're going to have a, a fantastic showing at the convention and be able to pull off the trifecta of the uh, convention, the primary, and the general. All right. Well, Marty Cipher, thank you again for coming on the show, and uh, stay warm in this chilly weather. Yeah, thank you. God bless. God bless you. And uh, that was Marty Seifert. You can check out his white website at seiffertforgovernor.com. Uh, and uh, we're going to be bringing in our East Coast correspondent very shortly, Sam Wayne Pierce. But before we do, I wanted to uh, play a video that was uh, recently taped at the Mall of America. And if you remember Zach uh, Sobiek, uh, he's a Stillwater uh, resident. He, he's passed on. Uh, God bless his soul. He died of uh, cancer, I believe. Uh, but he made that song, Clouds, and we played the song uh, you know, a while back uh, when the song became viral. It went on YouTube and played all over. It made the top of the iTunes chart. I think it was at number one uh, at some point for the most downloaded song. And recently at the Mall of America, uh, 5,000 people gathered in the uh, big rotunda to sing the song. And I just thought, you know, it's one of those things you see where you get real emotional and, and things like that. So I wanted to, to play that because it's this Christmas season and everyone should remember how blessed we are to have our health and uh, the people around us who we love.
So yeah, Zach Sobiak, uh, I just think that's so beautiful. You know, one person, one life, one song uh, that has done, you know, so much. And, you know, it's not even really about the song. It's about the person. It's about the idea. And, uh, yeah, somebody who at one point faced a life or death situation, you know, it just it brings a lump to my throat to think about, you know, just how precious life is and how every single moment is such a gift. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we get uh you know we get a little upset about this or that and at the end of the day they're all they're all little things so uh just keep that in mind and with that uh we're going to be tuning in or bringing in our east coast correspondent sam wayne pierce let me line this up here sam wayne pierce are you with us hello minnesota hello new york how's the weather in new york right now sam uh not too bad tony cold and snowy but uh what I wanted to say to you and to all of the viewers that uh, that it is uh, Pearl Harbor Day, oh, December yeah. oh, yeah. 7th, and uh, and I thought we could open this segment by discussing that, Tony. Sure. Uh, and and I think we might even have some footage lined up for the viewers. Is that right? Yeah, it is. It is. And can you uh, use your history uh, major here a little bit, Sam, and, and give us a little background of, uh, of Pearl Harbor while I pull up the pictures? Absolutely, Tony. I'd be, I'd be happy to. As as FDR said, uh, former President Franklin Roosevelt said, it's a day that lives on in infamy. And while Pearl Harbor took place 72 years ago, I think there are we got days mm -hmm. in the history of this country that are as meaningful and impactful as December 7th, 1941. But as time goes on, I think we talk about Pearl Harbor and World War II in general much less than we ever have. Tony, you and I are, are in our mid-30s, so we're not exactly old, but it seems like a lot has changed just in the last 15 to 20 years. And I had a, a personal story I wanted to share. My, my fiancé is an elementary school teacher, and yesterday after work I said, hey, did you, did you talk to your kids about December 7th and Pearl Harbor Day? And and she said no very nonchalantly and kind of just went on about our conversation. And I was disappointed but not surprised. Uh, so today before the show, I, I, did, I did my usual prep. I looked at a lot of newspapers and mm -hmm. Twitter. And I just think that we, like I said, it, it, even in just the last 15 to 20 years, we, we speak at, so much less about Pearl Harbor Day, about D-Day, about all of this history that is not so so distant. Tony, what do you think? Do you think that we remember those that gave their lives in, in Hawaii that day and in the, in the way the country came together for the World War effort? Do we do our history enough justice with our remembrances? I would say no. Um, and I don't know why. what the exact reason for that is, uh, but I was talking to, I had this uh, similar discussion a ways back, but you know, they were talking about the greatest generation, you know, when people during the World War II, you know, when, when uh, uh, Pearl Harbor was invaded, people lined up out of the door, you know, Americans to sign up for the uh, army, to sign up for the military, to go to war. And, you know, they compare that to the generations of today where, you know, people are more skeptical, uh, there isn't as much patriotism. Uh, that type of stuff is sometimes even looked down upon. Like if, if somebody wanted to sign up uh, for the military to go to war, they'd be like, are, are you crazy? Or, you know, what are you doing that for? And I don't know what the exact reason or difference is. I don't know if it's that there's a perception that modern wars are uh, more of the product of uh, the global leaders and kind of the global agenda versus... You know, you go back to World War II, and, and before that, I, I think that war had more of a nationalistic uh, fervor to it. So I think that is a partial explanation anyways as to why people, you know, uh, uh, why we're going away from our history a little bit. What do, you, do you think that's accurate, Sam? I do, and I, and I would add that, that we've been at war in the world for so long now if you think about it, Tony, since September right. 11th. So think about it. You and I were in college our last semester when September 11th happened and we're wow. still at war in the Middle East mm -hmm. all of these years later. So 
at the time of, of the Great War, World War One, and then World War Two, which was supposed to be the war to, well, I think actually World War One was the war to end all wars, and then World War Two uh, happened anyway. But both of them were kind of a once in a generation mm -hmm. thing. It didn't last forever. Uh, World War Two was, was four years, uh, as, as far as United States involvement, about six years for Europe. But mm -hmm. uh, now we're at war <laughs> everywhere, and mm -hmm. it lasts for so long. And maybe. Maybe to people's credit, that has something to do with it, that it's become almost a daily part of the news and people's routines, mm -hmm. and and it doesn't seem like such a unifying thing anymore. Yeah, and, you know, I think that maybe the Vietnam War is probably the war that really started uh, this type of perception. You know, Vietnam was... At least the invasion was justified by the Gulf of Tonkin, even though American soldiers were doing activities before then. They were already on Vietnamese soil to a certain degree, but not officially. Gulf of Tonkin, uh, I mean, from what I've studied about that, it, it never really happened. You know, that attack never actually occurred. There's no documentation of it, but the perception is, is that the Gulf of Tonkin occurred, and therefore that was the uh, spark that started the Vietnam conflict, and that was a brutal war. I mean, the, the footage, the perception of it, you know, the, what the soldiers did, God bless those people, uh, you know, going into to Vietnam, there's a, a lot of really, uh, you know, there's a r lot of really negative perception surrounding that particular uh, war, and I think because it was predicated on that Gulf of Tonkin, which was later shown to not have occurred as it was stated, and then you move forward, and we kind of see this pattern of either false flag uh, type inst instances or just uh, exaggerated threats, you know, such as the, the threat of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, which, uh, you know, still to this day, there's some people that say that those weapons moved into Syria and that they were in, in Iraq, but there's no evidence of it. And well, me, go ahead. Yeah. Well, that's true. And, and with Vietnam and the, the current wars, much of it in the Middle East now, I think there is a is lack of a military endgame or strategy, and you might have to go all the way back to World War II to really see a definitive United States foreign policy where following Pearl Harbor, the United States and its allies get together and they say the endgame is unconditional surrender for the, ja the Imperial Japanese and Nazi Germany. There, there was no talk of a separate peace or, or any sort of allowing uh, the Germany and Japan to go on uh, with, with their current governments and leadership. It was unconditional surrender and that was it. And, and as you pointed out in Vietnam, the United States gets into a war and I think there was a lack of strategy. Mm -hmm. And I think that continues to this day with a lot of our military engagements. Yeah, and you know, beyond uh, beyond Pearl Harbor, uh, another big historic event was the passing of uh, Nelson Mandela. And uh, I wanted you to just comment a, a little more on that as well. Tony, you're right. Uh, that, that's a, another loss this week of a, of a different kind for the world, not just the United States. Uh, you couldn't have turned on the news or, or, or read a paper at all the last... For eight hours or so, and not heard about the uh, unfortunate passing of, of Nelson Mandela. So, Tony, I, I think we would offer our condolences to, to South Africa, a, a country that's in mourning now over the loss of, of such an important leader. Mm -hmm. and Tony, like I said, if, if you turned on any news, you're, you're going to hear about Nelson Mandela the last couple days and probably for several days to come. And I, I found one story about the man to be very... Uh, inspiring and, 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 and kind of thought-provoking, and that is, in 1994, when he won the first really free and fair election of all of the people in South Africa, you know, all of the blacks and whites and everyone that could participate in the election for the first time, so Nelson Mandela wins, and the African National Congress comes to power after they've been basically oppressed forever. And now they have the task of governing the country. So Nelson Mandela comes into the government offices and the previous administration, some of these people were, were responsible for imprisoning him for 27 years. And he says to them, I understand that most of you are going to leave, but for those of you that want to stay, I invite you to stay. 
because hmm. I need you. Hmm. It, was, it was two reasons, Tony. One, it was this very pragmatic approach. They've been campaigning for, for civil rights um, for decades, but they know nothing about governing. So he needs that experience. And two, what better way to heal and reconcile a nation than to bring together everyone in your administration? Mm -hmm. And this is someone who had been imprisoned for 27 years, and mm -hmm. he was able to do that. It kind of puts our, our political polarization here in the United States to shame that our leaders can't do a better job even coming up with a budget. And they, they always say, I'm willing to work with those on the other side of the aisle. That's what they tend to say. But we've never, we, but the, the polarization right now is terrible. And look at what this man did in South Africa. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think that's a wonderful story. That's a, that's a great, uh, and I agree with that assessment. And, you know, we should say though that President Abraham Lincoln, you know, after the Civil War. I think he did some civil, similar steps in terms yes. of leadership and reparations. And I don't have any great quotes to line up, but I know that he really emphasized forgiveness and the 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 fact that the Southerners and the Confederates were Americans. And yes. he understood that for the sake of the uh, preservation of the Union and for um, you know, the future of unity in America, that it was absolutely essential to bring uh, the Confederates back into the Union immediately and, and with no penalties in many cases. Yeah, and, and I think that Abraham Lincoln is, is certainly one of our great leaders and Nelson Mandela, certainly one of, uh, w one of the world's great leaders uh, from outside the United States. So I, so I think that's a great <laughs> comparison, Tony. Um, and, I, and I know we need to move on, but uh, locally there in, in the Twin Cities, a story that is not so uplifting. Uh, you, you gave the audience and the, the viewers a, a pretty thorough update last week on what's going on with the Archdiocese of yeah. Minneapolis, St. Paul. And we have this unfortunate story, the type we don't like to cover, but can you give everyone another update on what happened this week and, and the priests and what's going on there? Yeah, well, when you were uh, you were gone uh, last week, so I had the full hour on my own, and I dedicated the full hour to the Archdiocese of, of St. Paul. You know, I just emphasized the fact that, uh, you know, I'm a Catholic, I practice the religion, I go to confession and mass and all that great stuff. Um, but I, as a Catholic, I was just disgusted and disheartened and disillusioned by the activities of some of the Catholic priests in, in St. Paul. And yeah, so what you said is the uh, Archbishop Neinstead, he released a list of 32 or 36 uh, names of priests that were credibly accused of sexual misconduct. I think around 30 of them were, uh, you know, doing sexual misconduct with minors and in particular young boys which I find uh, just absolutely horrible and, and disgusting. And then only two of the priests were it, involved in uh, women. And, you know, this was a step that the Archdiocese has taken in order to make amends, in order to move forward. And, you know, I, I, I think it is a necessary step, but I don't think that it's going to do a whole lot of good in terms of uh, keeping the unity of Catholics here in the St. Paul and Minneapolis area because... A lot of the names that they released, there was already uh, criminal records or, or police investigations, civil, uh, um, there was also civil movements, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of the right word, uh, civil, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for, Sam? Like a civil litigation? Yeah, there was yeah. civil litigation against some of these priests. So, so most of this stuff that they released was already known. And then the other part that, that I found, you know, just like it, it doesn't matter so much is a lot of the priests were, you know, these are things that happened 50, 60, 70 years ago. Uh, yeah, so a lot of the priests are dead already or passed on and, and some of them are retired. So it's like, you know, it's not addressing the worries and the issues that people have right now in the immediate. And I think that more uh, has to be done in terms of the leadership of the archdiocese and and that will remain to see there's still a lot of people uh, calling for the resignation of the archbishop here and you know it's a for my from my viewpoint you know I'm not making any judgments on the archbishop's character I'm not even uh, making judgments on his actions all I'm saying is that for the uh, sake of the unity of the church and so that to keep people 
active and participating in the church and to keep the unity that it would be best given the, the facts and, that have come out it would be best if uh, we had new leadership well tony one of the things that you and i talk about a lot is well, over the past probably 18 months i'd say a year to 18 months the obama administration has sort of gone through one scandal after another and we, we really dislike the way that that Jay Carney or the president himself says, the president knew nothing about this, and there's never any accountability. The buck stops nowhere, um, the opposite of, of, of Harry Truman. So um, th these allegations, depending on what turns out to be true, and, and all these children that were hurt for decades, if it's all true, then if we're going to be consistent, maybe we should say that the Archbishop needs to step down and that there needs to be some more serious action by the Catholic Church. Yeah, no doubt about that. And uh, so, Sam, did you see, uh, what did you think of uh, the governor candidate that was on earlier in the show, uh, former Representative Marty Seifert? Tony, I, I obviously listened along the whole time. And what I liked was at the end when he was talking about voting records and how someone may try to pinpoint one or two specific, specific votes from his past, and mm -hmm. he said, I think he used the word, sometimes you just have to man up and say, I made a bad vote. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that as, a, as a general issue, as a general um, thing, not, not a specific, but generally speaking, I really liked that because at the national level, in Congress and in the Senate right now, we don't have leaders that are willing to do that. That's right. And I think most Americans would like that. Look at look at all of the Senate Democrats that voted for Obamacare that are up for re-election. We've talked about this, and we might get into it a little bit more here in a second with Minnesota CD7, but so many are just backpedaling. And yeah. they're just saying, well, I'd vote for it again. It wasn't a bad vote. It's just it wasn't orchestrated properly and that's obviously not my fault yeah and, it, and, and it's exactly the reason why conservatives and, and libertarians and many many independents think that yeah there is a function and role of government and it's when you're dealing with the the common good the collective interest you know the things that only government can provide you know government can do best nobody uh, doubts that but when it tries to get into other things like health care or, for instance, like stadiums, it seems like more and more it's, it's many promises. They overpromise and they underdeliver versus vice versa. And I thought that the stadium issues in particular, we have two stadium issues now, Sam, here in, here in Minnesota. Uh, in St. Paul, they're trying to uh, build a stadium for the Saints, um, and yeah. it's in Lower Town, St. Paul, and they've come up with the initial designs, and I'm going to uh, pop up uh, that. Dallas, if you can do that. This is the uh, stadium now uh, in Lower Town, so you can see St. Paul downtown, St. Paul in the background. It looks nice, you know, right on the Mississippi River, um, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, and, uh, you know, it's on the backdrop, but a lot of people are actually... Uh, complaining about it because they think it's too gaudy and they think that it's going to actually take away from the real traditional uh, side of, of things in St. Paul. And, you know, there's a big debate about, you know, what they should do and people have different uh, reactions. But what I thought is interesting is if you can see where that stadium is located, uh, it's actually uh, proposed to be located in the last remnants of the old Gillette Diamond Products plant in St. Paul's lower town. So, Gillette uh, used to have an operating uh, plant there, a huge plant, jobs, manufacturing, and now it's being replaced by a government-subsidized stadium. And, and, and really, that's uh, the net effect of some of these policies that have been coming through is that they come in and they, they crush the productive sectors of the economy. And, and what grows in place of it? It's crony capitalism. And, uh, you know, I made that picture, too. I showed that picture earlier of uh, Governor Dayton and Ziggy Wolf, and we'll pop that up. And, uh, Sam, I wanted to get your, your reaction uh, from... Tony, I, 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 too, saw the picture, and, and you guys talked about, hey, is this true or not? So I thought the show should probably launch, you know, Tony Hernandez show investigation into the authenticity, but it sounds like you guys already spoke to the reporter, and he's saying it's true, but... I think this picture is so unbelievable uh, that I actually sent it into our, our forensic lab, kind of like when people report a picture of Bigfoot and it goes into the forensic lab for authenticity, because 
to me, it looks like Governor Dayton has a look on his face, what the heck am I getting myself into? <laughs> and Ziggy Wilf has a look on his face like, I just saved so much money at the taxpayer's expense that I'm going to bring Brett Favre out of retirement at $30 million a year. So, <laughs> uh, so I found it to be the uh, same reaction you had, that it, is this really legitimate? So we'll, we'll have to find out. This, this is the uh, face of caring and compassion that the Democrats have to offer. And, you know, it's, it's really what uh, is seen here is, is what you get, as you pointed out. And, you know, don't get me wrong. People will love the Viking Stadium when it's built. And if the Saints Stadium gets built in, in Lower Town, people are going to love that, too. Uh, but I think that my issue with this is, is getting the government involved in these projects. First of all, there's enough money in the NFL, and there's enough money in baseball, and there's enough money in this, in this state where these types of projects, if they're necessary, uh, they'll be funded uh, privately. And uh, they'll be done so with more efficiency and uh, more inclusivity in, in all, of, all of the works. But you know, the more and more we get government involved in all these different sectors of the economy, uh, really, this is a, a pathway for disaster and destruction for middle class families, for working class families here in Minnesota. So I just thought that that was a, an ironic picture. I don't know if it was put in the Star Tribune, uh, you know, what the, what the motivation behind it was. But, um, but yeah, I agree. A picture is worth a, a thousand words, but th this one, it, in fact, I think is worth uh, 10,000 plus words. So... I just thought that was pretty interesting, and it really begs the question, Sam, and we, we only got about two minutes left here, so maybe we can talk about this more in the next show, but uh, it begs the question, is the, is the Democrats' vision or re rhetoric of compassion and caring, is it starting to, to dwindle away in, in these failed policies? Because, you know, with the Affordable Care Act, for instance, like, yeah. you message it, yes, we want everyone to have health care coverage, you know, yes, we want the sick and the poor in this country to be taken care of, but does that necessarily mean that we need government to be the main vehicle in order to deliver these services, or is there a better route? And I think that as these policies unfold and as uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, becomes more known and the consequences become more dire, people are going to understand that caring rhetoric does not equal good policy. Your thoughts, Sam? Um, I think that there is caring rhetoric, but there's overreach, and I think sometimes the caring rhetoric stems from we know what's best for you better than mm -hmm. you do. Mm -hmm. And now all of these people that were convinced well, the government cares and they're going to give me insurance, and now they're getting these bills in the mail and they're seeing that they have to sign up mandatory sign up for these plans with very hefty premiums and deductibles that the likes of which they've never seen so huh. so well you know I think Tony you with, with about 30 seconds to go here that you that you hit the nail on the head that we'll have to continue to talk about the role of what's more and more a totalitarian government and I think uh, for this picture here, I think a great little bubble would be uh, if, if, if you could make a bubble outside of the picture, it, you know, out of Governor Dayton's mouth saying tax the rich. I think that'd be good. <laughs> but anyway, Sam, that's uh, the end of our show here. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. We broadcast live every Saturday from 4 o'clock until 5 o'clock here at SCC Television Studios in White Bear Lake. want to thank Governor Marty Seifert for coming on the show. May God bless you. May God bless America.